You, you guys know that deep in my heart, I want to be a stand-up comic, right? You know, and and so I practice the material on you. What I will tell you straight up is, I've used these jokes before, so you should laugh more this time when you hear it. I want to tell you a story of a man who wanted to give his friend a parrot for Christmas. Okay, so the week of Thanksgiving, he ended up giving the man the parrot, and he brought the parrot home and he put him in, up in a, a, a cage in the living room, and, and every time the man walked by the parrot, the parrot insulted him. Every time he walked by, the parrot would insult him, and it got to the point where he got so frustrated with the parrot, he opened the cage, grabbed the parrot, ripped him out of the cage, and threw him in his deep freezer, and he could still hear the parrot insulting him. And finally, the parrot stopped insulting, and the man started to worry, maybe I've killed the parrot. So he pulled him out of the deep freeze, and the parrot was shivering, but he was alive. And the parrot goes, I, I, I'm so sorry. I, I, I was rude to you. I, I will never say an insult to you again. And the man said, okay, I, I forgive you. He goes, I got one question. He goes, sure. He goes, what did the turkey do? I know. I know. I want to tell you another one. A couple of turkeys in the farm. Somebody finally got that back there. I want to tell you that there was these two turkeys in the farmyard there at the farm. And one turkey said to the other turkey, he says, there's something up. And he goes, why do you say that? He says, the farmer just unfriended me on Facebook. Okay. One more. One more, and then we'll get started. One more, and then we'll get started. You ready? You ready for this? Yes. You sure? I got to find this so I can tell you. Okay, there it is. Okay, here he is. What do you call a turkey with no feathers? Thanksgiving dinner. Okay. All right. Should I keep my day job? I'm a better pastor than, than, than comic. Okay. You see, I did all that just so you tell me I was a good pastor. I'm glad you do. All right. So, um, let, let's get started. I got a lot to really cover this morning. There's a lot for us to be thankful of. How many of you brought your Bibles this morning? Raise up your Bibles. I love to see that. It blesses me when I see that you guys with your, your Bibles, old school or new school, those of you that do have your smartphones or tablets with you, or those of you watching online with a smartphone or a tablet, you can go to YouVersion, you can go to the menu, you can click events, all the events in your area will pop up, search for Thrive Church, click that, hit save, and all of my notes will be there, okay? All right, that's, that's what they tell me anyway. So you guys got your outlines. I want to go ahead and jump right into it. Um, we do have a lot to be thankful for. We do have a lot to be grateful for. And I got to I got to tell you, I struggled writing this sermon this this week just simply because of where we've been this year and what has gone on. I mean, in the political world, it with the pandemic going on, people losing their jobs, all that stuff. It's been hard. But the Bible says we should be grateful. No matter where we find ourselves, if you got your outlines, or those of you that are looking on the um, U Version app, Colossians chapter two. I want to start there this morning, verses six and seven. It says, "And now, just as you trusted Christ to save you, trust Him too for each day's problems. Live in a vital union with Him. Let your roots grow down into Him and draw up nourishment from Him. See that you." Go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Let your lives overflow with joy and thanksgiving for all that he has done. I remember hearing a story once about a group of pastors up in the Northeast that got together right in the middle of the Great Depression back in 1929 when things were just so bad. And they got together the week before Thanksgiving to talk about how are we going to celebrate Thanksgiving in our churches? There's really not a whole lot to be thankful for. I mean, there's no signs of relief. They were saying that the bread lines were long, that people uh, were out of work. People had committed suicide because they lost their fortunes when the, when the stock market crashed. It was just horrible. And the term, the Great Depression, 
was apt. It was perfect for what was going on. Things were horrible. And they were, they were convinced that it, they probably shouldn't spend a lot of time talking about being thankful, being grateful for what was going on. But one of the pastors rallied the group and he says, you know, I don't believe this is a time for us to give just a mere passing of thanksgiving, that this is a time to help our people come together and rally together and get our nation together and, and get a right perspective and just stand up and thank God anyway, because no matter where you're at, there's blessings that he's given us. And I think that pastor was on to something. The most intense moments of thanksgiving, I don't believe are found when we've got plenty. I don't believe we have a grateful heart when things are going good. I think for most of us, that gratefulness really needs to come out of a sense of difficulty. It has to. And you think of the of the pilgrims uh, who claimed to have had the first Thanksgiving. However, we know the folks at Jamestown actually did. But the pilgrims were there. They were a people without a country. Over a third of them died in the first six months that they were here. Yet they found a way to praise God and to be thankful. Their gratitude was not for something, but their gratitude was in something. And I think about then that Abraham Lincoln proclaimed uh, that the nation would have a day of thanksgiving, which is awesome because we celebrate it today. But he proclaimed that in the middle of the Civil War. When the country was divided and torn and brother was fighting brother and, and killing each other. So here we are. Thanksgiving 2020. And I think about what's been going on. We've had now nine months. It feels like a thousand years of a world pandemic. We've had, uh, churches closed. I think back to the third week in March. When we couldn't open, and I remember the fact that we were here 12 weeks with just the AVL team and me. It was hard. I think back, the school I was working for, St. Leo University, I was working part-time with them. They closed their doors, and they're not going to open back up. Businesses shut down. I can't tell you how many businesses right here in Portsmouth one of the ones I know for sure, because I used to like getting their Burnswick stew, was Jones's Restaurant. Shut yeah. down. They're gone. There's all kinds of things have happened. People were out of work. I can't believe how many people were filing for unemployment in March and April and May. This year has been hard. It's been hard. And then we learned a lot of new terms this year we'd never heard before. Social distancing. What is that all about? You know, and and you go to the grocery store and now there's plexiglass between you and the cashier and there's marks on the floor where you have to stand. Things have changed so much in, in nine months. And I would have never believed a year ago if you'd have told me you wouldn't be able to find toilet paper in the grocery store. But here we are at the week of Thanksgiving. Things are going to be different this year. The CDC is saying don't travel. The CDC is saying don't celebrate Thanksgiving. I was reading last night, and it blew me away. I don't know. Some of you may have seen it. If, if you get the news feed part of Facebook, there was an article there about this has happened before, and it was a firsthand account that, that people had found from 1918 and the Spanish flu. You know, they canceled Thanksgiving that year. They canceled Christmas that year. 930,000 people died. And you know what? They had a vaccine. In November of, 2000, of 1918, they started administering a vaccine. Problem was, it was the wrong vaccine. You see, in 1918, they thought the Spanish flu was a bacterial disease, and it was viral. And my understanding is they didn't have the equipment to even see a virus under the microscope because it requires an electron microscope. So they were shooting in the dark, and they were giving people a vaccine that didn't do anything. 
for them. And I was like, gosh, I can't imagine. And they were showing headlines from the different newspapers and stuff. And when people would catch the Spanish flu, they were putting signs on their house to stay away. It was horrible. But they got through it. They got through it. We're going to get through this because the vaccines we're going to have are fighting a virus, not a, a bacteria. It's going to be better. It's going to come together. I, I, I say that, but I think I can't wait for it to get better. But in the process of waiting, we need to be thankful. In the process of waiting, we need to be grateful. Perhaps in your own life, you've had hardships. Maybe you lost your job because of this. Maybe you're struggling to, to help your kids in school because in school is at your kitchen table now. Whatever it is, you're experiencing your own private great depression. Why should we be thankful? Why? Well, I tell you this, we need to learn to. If we're not, we need to learn to. We need to learn to be thankful because if we don't, we're going to get discouraged. We need to learn to be thankful because if we don't, we're going to become bitter. We need to learn to be thankful because if we don't, we're going to become arrogant and, and self-satisfied. we got to do better. We need to learn to express thanks to God regardless of what's going on. You know, this would be an easy sermon to preach if everything was great, and it would just be talking about being thankful. You know, it's a great time to be alive. But the fact is, we are alive. Everyone in this room hopefully is healthy. Everyone watching online hopefully is healthy. We need to be thankful. Our hearts should overflow with gratitude to the one who made us. Our hearts should overflow with gratitude because he knows us by name. Psalm 100 gives, I think, probably the greatest guidelines for you and me how to be thankful and how to express that thanksgiving to God. Let's look at it together. Psalm 100. Shout to the Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God and he made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. You look at that psalm and it tells us that the life of every believer Everyone who has a relationship with Jesus, our life should be overflowing with thanksgiving, regardless of what's going on in our lives. Now, that's easy to say, but it's hard to accomplish. So what I want to do this morning is I want to walk through this psalm. I want to dissect this psalm and just kind of look at what the Bible is telling us we should do to have what I call an attitude of, of gratitude. How do we go about really being grateful? So if you got your outlines, the first thing we got to do is we must be we must have willing expressions of gratitude. Willing expressions of gratitude. So let's look at this psalm. Let's go into from the 50,000 foot level. Let's go down to the earth, to the ground level. Let's look at that first verse again. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. That's what the psalmist David told us to do. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. He's talking about joyful shouts. And the thing is, here's the deal as I was thinking about this. What is it about screaming and yelling and, and, and shouting that appeals to children so much? We were at our daughter's house yesterday to celebrate our granddaughter. In fact, last year... This Sunday, when, when we were celebrating Thanksgiving, I put a picture of baby June up on the screen, who is our newest grandbaby, and she was born the week before Thanksgiving. We were there yesterday celebrating her first birthday, and it's taken a year for her to warm up to Poppy, okay? 
up until yesterday, every time I got within 10 feet of her, she would start screaming. Yesterday, she wanted to share her birthday cake with Poppy. And we have pictures of that. I should have given John a picture and let him put it up there. She got so messy with chocolate cake. It was amazing. But, but Travis's son, our other grandson, Christopher, and, and our third grandson, Emmett, they were playing in a bounce house. The neighborhood knew they were playing in a bounce house. And then Christopher, I mean, um, Emmett's cousins came over. And when they came over, all of Virginia Beach knew they were playing in a bounce house. What is it about screaming and hollering and yelling that appeals to kids so much? You haven't figured? Joy, right? Yeah, and you know what we do as parents and grandparents? We spend half of our life telling them to sit down and shut up, right? How many times do you say things like, use your inside voice? But Psalm 100 says we're supposed to shout for joy. The Bible says an awful lot about us standing up and shouting out loud. Now, I know there's a, time and a place for everything and I know perhaps you know we think about that you're not supposed to do that you don't come to church and scream I guarantee you we're one of the only churches I'll I'll bet you this right now we're one of the only churches in all Hampton Roads that the pastor gets talked back to during the sermon (laughs) am I right I mean, I watch a lot of pastors preach online, and they don't got a Joe Halk in their auditorium. <laughs> they don't got a John Dowdy in their AVL booth, okay? But the thing is, we say there's a time and a place. So we come into church, and we sit down, and we're quiet, and we whisper, because for some reason, somehow, somewhere, somebody told us that was the right thing to do, that if we do that, We're being holy. Being quiet ain't got nothing to do with being holy. Joe said we were brought up that way. We were. We were. A lot of people, they, they, we were taught you go in church, you be quiet. And if you do anything, if you say anything, oh, that's not good at all. But the, the deal is this. The biggest question is not necessarily what makes us feel most comfortable in church. The question actually should be, what will please God the most in church? And this psalm says we're supposed to be shouting to the Lord. Now, let me say something real quick. The volume of the sound alone is not what impresses God, okay? What impresses God is the volume. You might want to write this down. The volume of our heart when we express joy to the Lord. It's not the volume of our noise, but the volume of our heart. You see, when we thank God for what he has done and we praise God for who he is, the question becomes, how much of your heart is in it? How much of your heart is in it? I mean, if we only thank God when we remember to, when we sat down to eat, I got to tell you, you ain't got a lot of heart in the game, okay? This psalm says we're supposed to shout for joy to the Lord. In fact, look what, what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, give thanks in all circumstances, for it is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Praise God. My next door neighbor's got COVID-19. Praise God. I lost my job. Praise God. I mean, we think this is ridiculous, right? But the Bible says we're supposed to be praising God in every circumstance because this is what God's will is. God wants us to. We're supposed to be overflowing with thanksgiving. And what that means basically is we're supposed to thank God with all of our hearts every chance we get. Now, if you're anything like me, sometimes 
I'm a little shy to do that. Sometimes I get a little bear, embarrassed doing that. So instead of doing what I think I'm supposed to do or I know I should do, sometimes I sit kind of quiet. Sometimes I don't shout for joy to the Lord. Sometimes I'm worried what people will think if I do. Is that you? Don't lie. Don't lie, okay? Is that you? I mean, it's one thing to go to a football game and shout. It's one thing to go to a NASCAR race and shout. It's one thing to yell at your dog. It's another thing to yell hi at your neighbor. But you come to church and you sit down and you don't do anything. A lot of times we come in here for worship on Sunday mornings, not with an attitude of worship, but an attitude that says, okay, praise team, let's see if you sound good. Okay, praise team, show us what you got. Okay, praise team, entertain us. And that's the wrong attitude. They are here for one purpose only. And in the, in the mornings before you guys get here, when the staff gets together to pray, a lot of times I will pray for the praise team to lead us to God's throne room. That should be our attitude. I can't wait for the praise team to lead us to God's throne room. Why? Because I'm going to shout for joy to the Lord. Now, for a lot of us, that's kind of weird, okay? But I'm going to tell you what, the best worship service I ever was in was one of the weirdest places I've ever been in my life. When I was getting ready to be ordained as a pastor, I ain't telling you how long ago, I I had to go to this camp meeting set up, right? That's where they're going to ordain us, and it was a big building, and I don't know, you guys, you guys have been to Dunn, what is it, about a thousand seats in that room? And it was full. And when the service started, oh my God, I was like, I'm not in Kansas no more. I mean, people were dancing, people were shouting, people were raising their arms to Jesus, and people were just totally oblivious to everybody else in the room. And the music won't that good. The singing won't that good. But my gosh, the worship experience was off the chart. And then this guy that you've probably, if you if you heard Pastor Jim ever talk about his mentor, Dr. Herbert Carter. Dr. Carter got up to pray, and the only thing I heard him say was, let's bow our heads. Because for the next 10 minutes, people were speaking in tongues and screaming and shouting and hollering. And as the noise died down, I heard Dr. Carter say, in Jesus' name, amen. Wow. But the reason I tell you that is this. When they walked in that room, they left their inhibitions outside. When they walked in that room, they expected God to move. And it changed everything. And it blesses God. Now, we always think we're supposed to be getting a blessing from God. But the fact of the matter is, we need to be blessing God. We need to be giving thanksgiving to God. We need to be grateful to God. And I challenge you, if you change your attitude when you walk in that door in the mornings, because it don't matter what the praise team sounds like. It don't even matter if you like the song. What matters is your expression of thanksgiving to God. And we can do that in the middle of a pandemic. We can do that when things aren't as good as they should be. In fact, we should be doing it more when things aren't as good as they should be. God wants our praise. We need to shout to the Lord Maybe even jump around a little bit. Scream a little bit. Become a kid in a bounce house again. Here's the thought. My my point is God deserves our best praise. And he deserves our best thanks. And he'd like to see a little energy in it. 
Here's a challenge for you. If you're not comfortable shouting in public, if you're not comfortable shouting for joy in front of other people, then what I want to challenge you to do this week is find some place somewhere where you can do it. Okay? Maybe it's in your car. Don't worry about the people driving around next to you. They're just going to think you're weird. Okay? They don't know you. You don't know them. Okay? Shout in your car. Go out in your garage and shout. Shout in the shower. But you might want to warn your family before you, you do that. Okay? Begin to celebrate what God has done for you and who he is. Thank him for nothing else. Thank him for giving you. I mean, your whole world may be falling down around you, but if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, your eternity sealed. Thank him for that. Thank him for that. Thank him providing what you need. Maybe not always what you want, but what you need. And you may feel kind of silly, okay? But when your favorite team scores in football, you scream. You know, this psalm, in this psalm, the following expressions of thanks and praise are similar. Let's look at the, let's look at the second verse. Let me make sure I didn't miss something. I haven't missed nothing, have I, Jonna? Okay, good. Just, okay, stay with me, okay? We'll, we'll get to the end of this sooner or later. I didn't tell the staff this morning I have 56 pages of notes. I didn't tell him. Anyway, Psalm 100, verse 2, it says, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Let's dissect that a little bit. Worship with gladness. Glad worship. Now, I'll be honest with you. There are some times when we need to be quiet. There are some times when we need to be somber in worship. But there's also got to be times for gladness in worship. There also has to be times where we're excited to come before him with joyful songs, songs of celebration. You ever find yourself singing a song you can't get out of your head? And, and hopefully it's a good song that you can't get out of your head. I tell you, you know, with me, you know, my, my newest, greatest, what I really like in music is, is Lauren Daigle. And, and I've got her CD, thanks to Travis. I got her signed CD, thanks to Travis. And the CD itself is in my car. And sometimes I just push play, you know. And all of those songs are amazing. But the first song on that album is the, the it, it just, oh, I can't even tell you what the name of it is right now. But it's Rolling Stone. And it's, it is just, oh, man, they're still Rolling Stones. It's about God rolling away the stone from the, the grave. And it's amazing. And I find myself singing that song. And then I walk into Roses or I walk into Food Line or I walk into Walmart and I can't get the song out of my head. Well, you know, that's okay. That is okay because it says come before him with joyful songs. This is a way we express thanksgiving to him. And for some reason, I, I don't know why, but God's God and I can't figure it out. But for some reason, he enjoys hearing us do that. It would probably drive me crazy if I was God. But he enjoys hearing us sing. Even if you can't sing, he enjoys it. And here's the deal. The Lord is worthy of the best expressions of praise that you and I can give him. All right, let's move on to number two. Number two is this, we must get the right perspective. We must get the right perspective. Let's continue looking at this psalm. Let's look at verse three. Verse three says, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. See, it is, it is vitally important for you and me to recognize who God is. That is paramount, okay? It says, know that the Lord is God, Yahweh. Yahweh, what, is that, what does that mean? That means the one true God. There's no other God. There's no one before him. He alone is divine. He alone is all-powerful. He alone is all-present. And he alone loves you and me unconditionally and completely. That's important to know because only God is worthy to receive our praise. 
And here's the deal. It's not enough just to know who he is. In fact, it's not enough just to know that God loves me so much that he sent his son to die for me. It's not enough that I know who he is and I know that he loves me and sent Jesus. It's not enough. Just knowing that there is a God who loves me ain't going to change me. Romans chapter 10. I go back to this verses a lot. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You see, when we invite the God who loves us into our lives and ask him to establish a relationship with us and ask him to forgive us, then we begin to know him in a real, intimate way personal way and that should change the way we act if we really understand who he is in our small mind just knowing who he is and what he's done for us it should change the way we act and and when we come to know that he's God through a, a personal personal experience with him then we should be able to give him thanks It should be the natural outpouring of what we've experienced. It says that that, that he is God. Know that he's God. Understand that he's the creator. It is he who made me. It is he who made you. And we don't belong to ourselves. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to the one who created us, God. And, and, And he made us in his very own image. And here's the deal. He has the right to ask us for our obedience. Even in more of a way than we as parents have the right to ask obedience of our children. So even though we owe our love to God, here's something that's real important. He only wants our love if we freely and willingly give it to him. That's an important thing to understand. You see, if we make any effort at all to get to know God, then it won't be difficult for us to love him. We owe our lives to him, and he is powerful. He's the creator, and he loves us. That is so powerful and the the third thing there there, i'm not the third point but the third thing in this point my brain talking is we need to recognize who we are and to whom we belong it is so important see we belong to god we are his sheep the bible says the bible says he leads us he he guards us he protects us he provides for us he gives us rest He gives us nourishment. The Bible says he restores our soul. The Bible says he walks through us in a dark valley. So listen to me. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life right now. And I look around this room. Some of you are struggling with major medical issues in your life. He's walking beside you. Some of you, because of this pandemic, you've lost your job. He's walking beside you. It doesn't matter what we're going through. He walks beside us. Why? Because he's the shepherd and we are the sheep. That should be enough to make us want to thank him. That should be enough to make us want to be grateful to him. Number three, got to move on. Gosh, I hate clocks. I say that every week too. I think for Christmas, I'd like to have no clock. That would be good. Number three, we must offer a gift of gratitude. Continuing on, look at verse four. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. When I look at that verse, the first thing I see out of it is that we have to approach him with a thankful heart. 
There's, there's two Hebrew words in this verse that, that are rendered as thanksgiving and thankful, but I think it's unique that there's actually two of them. The first one says, we enter his gates with thanksgiving. That comes from the Hebrew word toda, toda, which refers to a sacrifice. It refers to giving something out of praise or producing a song of thanksgiving. And that's how we're supposed to enter his presence, thanking him with words, thanking him with songs, thanking him with anything else that we can use to let him know we're grateful, that we appreciate him. The second phrase in that verse says, be thankful to him. The word thankful there is the, is the Hebrew word yada. I love that, yada, yada, yada. Yada is actually a Hebrew word that, that says, that means thankful. Now, here's something a little, just kind of a little trivia thing for you in case you, you ever need something to talk about around the dinner table, okay? The Hebrew word for Judah is Yadua, okay? And if you abbreviate Yadua, the abbreviation of it is Yada. And understand that Judah means people of thanks people of praise and yada means to be thankful so i just think that's kind of cool but as as god's people we're supposed to approach him with a thankful heart it says we're supposed to show appreciation for who he is thanking him for what he has done and then the second part in that verse says praise and bless him praise and bless him the word for praise in verse four is tehillah and Tehillah actually means to sing a song of praise, okay? Whether you can sing or not, sing a song of praise. And, and in Hebrew culture, typically a group of worshipers who would go to the temple to offer praise to God, they would start outside of the temple with one person in the group starting to sing a song. And as they walked towards the temple, the other people in the group would begin to sing with them. So by the time they get to the temple, there's like this chorus of people singing praise to, the God, to God. And so my question becomes, does your life reflect a song of praise? Does your life reflect, huh? Huh? It got quiet. Does your life reflect a song of praise? Here's the deal. Listen to me. I know I'm not talking to anybody in this room, but I'm going to say it anyway, all right? If you tend to dwell on the negative side of everything that's going on in your life, and if you're primarily concerned with how others have wronged you or mistreated you, listen to me, you probably won't provoke a song of praise in your life. Just saying, okay? In fact, if that's who you are, you're probably creating, should I say, yeah, I'm going to say this. If that's who you are, the people who are following you are singing the blues. And that doesn't honor God. I'm just saying. And there's a lot of people who carry a lot of negative stuff. There's a lot of people, even though the person who, who mistreated them asked for forgiveness, they said, I forgive you, but they lied, okay? And the next time you do something, even if it's years later, guess what you do? You bring it right back up again. So everybody around you has gotten really good at singing the blues. The Bible says we're supposed to project a song of praise, so that everybody around us joins in the chorus. That's what's important. Whether you do that or not is the question. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Do you not know that your bodies are a temple to the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Bodies. Now understand something. Individually, the Bible says our bodies are temples for the Holy Spirit. When we have a relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We are a temple. And collectively, as a church, we uh, are the body of Christ, which is also a temple to the living God. 
So individually and corporately, we are a temple to God. Therefore, we should thank God. We should praise God. Praise should always be on our lips. It's important to understand the word bless in this scripture is the word baruch, which means to bless God as the only source of strength and power. That's who God is. Now, here's the deal. What I get out of that is this. If I'm weak and I have no strength, the closer I get to God, the stronger I get. He's my strength. He's my source. That's important for us to know. Finally, there's, there's one more th thing here that's important. Number four, we must find the proper motivation. We must find the proper motivation. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The Lord is good. Now, quite honestly, a lot of people struggle with that. A lot of people say, well, if God is so good, why does he allow this to happen? If God is so good, why do we have this pandemic? If God is so good, why did I lose my job? If God is so good, why can't I find toilet paper? <laughs> I might as well stop. <laughs> If, if you don't understand what John had just said, see her after church. She'll show you what you get from China. Listen, here's the deal. That's a good question when people ask it. It's not a bad question. It's a good question that I don't have time this morning to actually explain in detail. But I can tell you this. Adam and Eve chose to disobey God. And when they did, it introduced sin into our world. It introduced death into our world. And here's another thing, guys. Because we're born with a sin nature, the blame doesn't lie completely with Adam and Eve. We're to blame too, okay? So Isaiah chapter 53 says this. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. The Bible also says that the Lord looked down from heaven to see if anybody, if there was just one righteous person on the whole earth, and he found none. You know why? Because there's no perfect people on this earth. Nobody can be righteous in their, on their own. The Bible says we've all gone astray. But the Bible also says that God in his love and his goodness, he sent his son Jesus as our savior. And we're getting ready starting next week. We're going to start the Christmas series. Starting next week when you come in here, the church is going to be decorated for Christmas. And in the Christmas story, it tells us that, that he sent his son and he would be named Jesus. It's so important that Mary got that. When the angel said, you will call him Jesus. Because you see, the name Jesus in Hebrew is Yahshua. And you know what that means? Yahweh is salvation. We can be forgiven and have eternal life because of the baby in a manger. We can be forgiven and have eternal life because the God of heaven and earth loves us. However, we still live in a fallen world. And because we live in a fallen world, there's going to be pain. And because we live in a fallen world, there's going to be misery. And the pain and the misery is all because of sin. No human being, period, is exempt from suffering. In fact, the Bible says we're going to suffer. Although God has given us many blessings in this life, like deliverance and freedom and healing, there's still going to be pain. And I have the gift of encouragement, okay? The point of all this is to show, though, that God is good. That even in pain, God is good. That even in misery, God is good. Even in sickness, God is good. Even in the middle of a pandemic, God is good. Therefore, we should be grateful. He's patient. I praise him. He's patient. 
because I get it so jacked up. You know? He's patient to me. He's kind. He wants all of us to come to him. He wants to give us forgiveness. He wants to give us eternal life. And this should be our motivation to be grateful. No matter where we are, no matter what we're going on, it doesn't matter. And the other part of that verse says that his love will never fail. His love endures. He will never stop loving us. You know how I know that? This is, this is a deep theological piece that, that you tried to, I tried to wrap my brain around when I was in seminary, and it got really confusing. And again, I'm a simple person, so I went back to the simple explanation. God will never stop loving us. How do I know that? Because it is in his nature to love, and he is perfect. If God stopped loving us, it would indicate he's not perfect. He won't stop loving us because he is. In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote a whole chapter in his letter to the church at Corinth about love. And yes, we all use it in weddings. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you know, he's writing about the kind of love that every Christian should have. He says, love never fails. Here's the deal. When Paul wrote this chapter, he was describing how we should act as believers. But that's not the only thing he was describing. What he actually was describing in that chapter was how God does act. That's how God loves us. His love never fails. It just flows out of God's nature. See, other stuff's going to fail. Listen to me. In case you don't know this, people in your life are going to fail you. People in your life are going to hurt you. Sometimes they mean to do it. Sometimes they don't mean to do it. But they're going to fail you. But God's love never will. He's always faithful too. It says his faithful continues through the generations. He's going to be faithful. He can be trusted. He will never give up on you. Why do I know that? Because he's perfect. If he would give up on us, it would show he's not perfect. If you can wrap your brain around that, it changes your whole perspective of God. He loves you. He's never going to give up on you. He, even, even when we're tempted to give up on him, he's not going to give up on us. When we try to run away from him, he's not going to run away from us. If you don't feel God's presence, he hasn't moved. Just saying. He's going to see us through. And what I've been talking about this morning is just this. Psalm 100 should be a foundation for every one of us. No matter where we're at. No matter what lies ahead of us. We should be thankful. We should show gratitude. We should have an attitude of gratitude. And it flows out of who God is, not who we are. That's important. So here we are at Thanksgiving 2020. Everything this year is thrown at us. We can still stand tall and be grateful to God. I don't know what you plan on Thursday. I don't know if you've got 28,000 people coming to your house, which would probably upset the CDC. Or you're going to be sitting at home with your cat and a TV dinner. I don't know which it is or somewhere in between. What I do know is that we can be thankful to God for what he has done. The other thing I know is that this too will pass. We will look back on 2020 as a year that we grew, that we changed the way we think. We changed the way we do things. What I hope is when we look back on 2020, we realize things that maybe we wouldn't, wouldn't have realized if there wasn't a pandemic. I'm not sure the whole issue of racial inequality and social justice would have come to light without a pandemic. What I can tell you 
is that it's opened a lot of people's eyes that maybe would have never been opened because they'd have kept doing what they've always done, not realizing that what they were doing was a social injustice. I believe God has a purpose for every one of us through this pandemic. And just knowing that ought to make us grateful. It ought to make us realize that God's going to get us through this. And that alone should be reason to praise him. So as we close, I'm going to ask you to take five seconds and just shout praise to God. Can you do that? Let's shout to him. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, you are an amazing God. Father, you, 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 you love us when we don't love ourselves. And I thank you for reminding us that you never leave us. That this year has been hard. This year has been difficult. This year has been weird. But you never change. Help us focus on you. Help us to remember on Thursday, whether we're with family or by ourselves, that there's reason to be thankful because you are God and you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.